Good morning, everybody, and Merry Christmas. Welcome to our last church service for the year 2020. I'm so pleased that you could join us today. And I know that for each of us, we've experienced this past year in different ways, and we've each faced different challenges, disappointments, and, and losses, and also some unexpected joy as well. But I hope that whatever your circumstance is over this holiday, that you'll be able to really tap into the restful, rejuvenating presence of God. And if you have time this week, maybe even sit down and take a few minutes to pray and ask God to highlight for you those times over the past year where he was clearly present with you because um, God has not forgotten you and he is with you, he loves you, and he will continue to be with each one of you as we move into the year 2020. So if you have your Bibles nearby, go ahead and open up to Matthew chapter 6. It's part of the Sermon on the Mount, and this is what Chris will be teaching from as we step back into our beautiful series. And Chris is going to read um, a passage from Matthew chapter 6 in just a moment. But uh, just as a teaser, I'm going to read for you a couple of verses, and then we'll pray and open with a worship song for Nathan. So uh, Matthew chapter 6, starting at verse 33. Instead, desire the first and foremost God's kingdom and God's righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, stop worrying about tomorrow, because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you so much for this time that we have together to worship you, to center our hearts and our lives around who you are, Jesus. We ask that as we look back over the year 2020 and look ahead to the year 2021, that we would be centered and grounded in who you are, that we would remember that we are children of God, that we are disciples of you, Jesus. We take our cues from you and we long to follow after you. As we gaze on you, on the beauty of who you are, on the beauty of your kingdom and your righteousness. Would you wash away all the worries, all the anxieties that we, we may be carrying with us as we step into a year that is pretty uncertain. And we just declare right now that we trust you, Lord. We trust you with our hearts, with our lives, and with this next year ahead of us. So we ask that uh, you would fill us with joy and anticipation to find out each day what it is you're going to lead us through. And uh, we ask for a real sense of your presence and your love as uh, we wake up each morning and we go to bed each night. Thank you for bringing us this far and um, we trust you with this next year ahead of us. In your name we pray, Lord. Amen. Let's sing together. Face. 
you're beautiful. I see your face, you're beautiful. You're beautiful, you're beautiful. Oh, 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 oh you're beautiful. Hey, everybody. Uh, hopefully you have your Bibles uh, handy and still open to Matthew chapter 6. And uh, we're just going to read through uh, some verses here, beginning at verse 24. I'm just going to make a couple of comments as we read through, and then we'll get into our teaching time for this, our last online service of 2020, last sermon of 2020. And so beginning at verse 24, Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. Jesus is helping us to see that there is a polarizing effect when you serve two masters. 
And now he gets really specific here and he says, you cannot serve both God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry. This is the first time in this passage he's going to say that, but he is going to say it two more times. Do not worry. Do not worry about your life. By the way, um, I think helpful hint here. One of the ways that you'll know that you're serving two masters is that your life will be characterized by worry. So do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? Obviously, the answer is no. You cannot add hours to your life. You can subtract them. Uh, with worry. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? You of little faith. So, second time, do not worry saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans, these are the people who have no relationship with God whatsoever, the pagans run after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, here it is, third time, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Let's, uh, just before we go any further, let's pray. Father in heaven, um, we just bow before you right now, acknowledging the fact that this is your word, uh, your word. And so we ask for your help to understand your word. And so would you, uh, Holy Spirit, would you take these truths and press them into our hearts and into our minds so that we can learn what you want us to learn, so that we can know what you want us to know. But not just for the sake of knowledge and information. We, we want to be transformed, which is a work that, that you do, Holy Spirit, in our lives. Um, and so we ask that you would do this transforming work, use the word in the process so that we might become followers of Jesus following more closely our Savior in terms of our attitudes and our actions. And so we pray that you would help us to have open minds and open hearts. And uh, would you have your way in our lives this day? For Jesus' sake, amen. All right, Jesus says, do not worry. Um, there you have it. Happy New Year. See you next year. No, not quite. Do not worry. Um, it's, it's so simple, right? It's straightforward. It's easy to understand what it is that Jesus is saying. Just don't worry. Well, let me try and put some words to what I think many Christians feel, but perhaps never say. And it is this that this teaching of Jesus, as well as many other teachings of Jesus, seem kind of unrealistic, kind of impractical, kind of pie in the sky. Like, is it even possible to have a life without worry? <laughs> like, is that even something that, that can actually happen? You know, maybe, maybe you might, might want to say to Jesus, but you would never say it. Um, something like, Jesus, this is nice. Do not worry. That's a nice idea. That's a nice thought. And maybe, you know, maybe Jesus, that worked pretty well back in the first century um, when things were simpler. But this is the 21st century. And Jesus, things are more complicated now. We've got the internet and we've got coronavirus and we're locked down and there's all these pressures and all this stuff and work is weird and, and uh, the economy is perilous and, and it's just so complicated. And Jesus, you, it's, it's, you know, the first century was one thing, but this, this is pretty complicated stuff. So, you know, 
Uh, don't worry. Mm, that might work on some planets, but not planet Earth. For sure not planet Earth in the 21st century during a pandemic. And you know what? I'm, I am quite certain that at least some of you who are watching this service are facing some real challenges. And, and not just the kind of challenges, oh, like what cut of steak am I going to barbecue for New Year's Eve? No, like challenges, questions about really the necessities of life, challenges about food, about clothing, about shelter, about employment, and, and am I going to have it? Um, some really serious challenges. Maybe some of you um, received one of those, what was it, like 400,000 letters from uh, CRA saying you might have to pay back some or all of the CERB money uh, because you thought it was based on uh, net and it was based on gross or whatever the misunderstanding was. And then, you know, do not worry, right? That just seems so pie in the sky. But I think, you know, for many people, including many Christians, that worry has become just such a part of our life that it just almost seems normal now. It's like a fish, like at a fish bowl. You look at a fish and you might ask yourself the question, I wonder if that fish feels wet in there. And probably the answer is no, because that fish is so immersed and so conditioned by the water that they don't even know they're in it. And I think that's kind of true of a lot of people in terms of worry. So immersed in it and conditioned by it that they don't even realize that they're experiencing it. And I think it's important to note what Jesus is not saying here. He's not saying, don't ever think about those things. He's not saying, don't ever think about clothes, don't ever think about food, don't ever think about what you're going to drink, don't think about tomorrow. He's not saying that. But what he is saying is that there is a kind of life where you don't worry about those things. Now, we might ask, is that even possible? Uh, but that's what Jesus is saying here. And I think it's also important to note right off the bat that... Um, that Jesus in his teaching, what he's, what he's not doing, he, he's not simply giving us little ethical rules. That is not what Jesus' teaching is like. This teaching of Jesus and all other teachings of Jesus, he's not giving us just little moral to-dos, like little moral um, rules to tack on to our life, leaving the rest of our life unchanged. Jesus is not doing that. The teachings of Jesus are not like some playbook where we, you know, we look at the circumstances or situations that we're in, and then we, you know, we look to the playbook to, to find out what to do in this particular situation or that particular situation. I think many times people and Christians understand Jesus' teaching like that, that he's giving us uh, ethical rules that he's giving us uh, like a, like a playbook uh, for for certain circumstances that were that we're facing. Um, a book that I found helpful in in um, preparing some of this message is a book by one of my favorite authors, Greg Boyd, and it's a book called Seeing Is Believing. If you happen to uh, come across that book, it's it's a worthwhile read along the lines of of uh, these things. Now. Um, I think when when we when we think that that the teaching of Jesus is like little ethical rules or like a playbook, we're really misunderstanding the teachings of Jesus. Um, you've probably watched at least a little bit of a football game if if you're not a, a football fan. And uh, sometimes what you might notice in a football game is the quarterback reaching for his wristband and kind of pulling it back and then sort of studying it. Well, what is that? Uh, well, what is on that quarterback's wristband are plays to run, plays that they will utilize depending on what the circumstances are in the game and at what uh, point of the game they're at. Like, for instance, if, if, uh, if you've got the ball and it's the fourth quarter, you're down by three points, you've just crossed over the 50-yard line, you're now into... Um, the opposition territory, like on their 48-yard line, you're too far away to kick a field goal, but now it's third and 10, so what do you do? Well, you look at the plays, or maybe there's like an offensive coordinator on the sidelines who's, who's relaying calls to you as the quarterback, and it's like, okay, run play number uh, 27, and so you look and see what play number 
27 is. I'm gonna show you a picture here right now. This is a picture of Tom Brady's wristband. So if you know anything about football, you probably know about Tom Brady, a very successful uh, quarterback, played uh, almost all of his career with the uh, New England Patriots, won a bunch of titles, I think like six, and uh, now plays for Tampa Bay Buccaneers. But this is a picture of of uh, Tom Brady's wristband. He's on the field looking at the plays. And you can see there that there are 45 different plays. This is still when he was a, was a Patriot. And so these plays will be used in different situations and at different points in the game. And I think this is why, one of the reasons why quarterbacks get paid so darn much money, because they're tasked with like memorizing all of this code and knowing exactly what it means, not just for them, but for the other 10 players on the field as well. It's, it's pretty overwhelming. It's a lot of data. So let's just kind of zoom in on one of these plays. Like look at play number 45. For instance, G Brown RT74 Haas X follow. Oh my goodness. Well, we you know, you could you could dissect that a lot. Essentially, among other things, this is going to tell Tom Brady that in this play he's going to line up in the shotgun position that there's not going to be a running back, that there's going to be five receivers, three on one side, two on the other. Uh, the tight end is going to line up on the right side of the formation. Uh, it's gonna. This is gonna talk about the the kind of protection that they're gonna set up, the kind of routes that the receivers gonna be five receivers, the different routes they're going to be running. Um, here is that play drawn up like on a chart. So check this out. Uh, I'm not sure this simplifies anything. In fact, it might even make it look more complicated. But you think of the fact that uh, here's this is just one of 45 plays. Um, that Tom Brady has to know as intimately as he knows his own name. And he's got to know exactly what he's got to do and what all 10 of the other people on the field with him are doing as well. So, you know, Tom Brady takes the snap, he's got the ball, and he's got about three seconds. And in those three seconds, he's got to look at each one of his five receivers. He's got to do an assessment of which one is the best option in that moment, while also in those three seconds, looking at the defense and diagnosing what the defense is doing. And uh, also in those three seconds, uh, there is a 300 pound guy on the other team that is running for him, wanting to drive him into the dirt. And um, yeah very specific plays for very specific circumstances. And some people look at the teaching of Jesus like that. Like I'm facing a particular situation, so I look at the Jesus playbook, Jesus, what do I do now? Or I'm, I'm in a situation, Jesus, what's the rule in this situation that I can just tack on here? Well, here's a, here's a situation. So you're at home and uh, with your family, and somebody is breaking into your house and they're, 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 um, they're armed. They look like they want to do you harm and maybe do, your har do uh, harm to your family as well. What do you do? Jesus playbook. Do good and love your enemy. That's the rule that you tack onto that situation. That's the play that you run in this situation. And I'll tell you what love your enemies, that's going to sound awfully impractical and awfully unrealistic in that situation. And so if you're, if you're looking at the teaching of Jesus, like ethical rules that you just consult when you're facing an enemy, it is no doubt going to be impractical and unrealistic. Jesus is not simply giving us ethical rules to follow. He's not simply giving us plays to run in certain uh, circumstances. If we understand his teaching like that, that it's ethical rules to tack on and plays to run at, in various circumstances, it is going to be unrealistic. It is going to be impractical. It is going to be idealistic. But what Jesus is doing, and this is so important to understand, what Jesus is doing in all of his teaching, whether he's talking about loving your enemies or whether in Matthew 6 he's talking about do not worry, what Jesus is doing in all of that, he is, he's inviting us in um, on a whole other way of doing life, a whole different lifestyle. 
You see, if we try to apply the teaching of Jesus to love your enemies, when all the rest of your life you're not cultivating an attitude that is conducive to that, then it will be totally impossible for you to love your enemy when it really counts to do that. And, uh, you know, similarly, if, if in your life you are living under a ton of stress, if your lifestyle has all of this pressure into it, and you say, okay, Jesus, what's the play here? Uh, oh, okay, do not worry. You know, what's the rule here to tack on? Do not worry. That's going to seem pretty idealistic and impractical, almost as if Jesus is just going to send you like a happy face emoji, like, you know, don't worry, be happy kind of thing. Remember that song from the 80s? That was a bad song. Um, what Jesus is doing in all of his teaching, he's inviting us into a different kind of life, a radically different kind of life, what he calls a kingdom life, the kingdom life, the domain in which he is king, the kingdom, the dome of the king, the domain of, of the king. And he calls us to, to this life, this lifestyle, this kingdom lifestyle, because it's this kingdom lifestyle that reflects God's beauty, that reflects the shininess of God's beauty. Because if we cultivate this kingdom life 24-7, then what we find is that our life begins to take on a beautiful dimension that it otherwise would not have. And so we're, we're back in this beautiful series now. I guess I should have mentioned that. We left this series off before we jumped into Advent, and now we're, we're kind of back in it. And what we're doing in this series is we're looking at the beauty of God, the, the beauty of God, our beautiful God. And uh, so we needed a definition for beauty. We borrowed one from Jonathan Edwards, a preacher from the 18th century, who said that beauty is a pleasing and harmonious relationship. And so we say that God is beautiful. He is beauty, Father, Son, and Spirit dwelling together in beautiful, loving relationality. Father, Son, and Spirit in triune unity. So God himself is a pleasing and harmonious relationship. Last week we said that that is shalom. That is peace. That is, that's this peace that, that um, has to do with well-being and integration and cohesiveness. That is God. God is beautiful. He is shalom. And so for us to display the beauty of God is for our lives to display pleasing and harmonious relationship, first of all, with him, with ourselves, and with each other, and with the creation. The opposite of that, I suppose we could call it an ugly life. And an ugly life, instead of displaying the, the cohesiveness, the pleasing harmony of God, we display a lack of harmony. We display, instead of pleasing and harmonious relationships, we maybe display fractured and uh, a, a degree of disunity in our relationships and, and a life devoid of, um, of cohesion. And what God wants us to do Really, what he wants, he, he wants to take our lives, he wants to take our, our fragmented lives that are characterized by these incongruencies and to, to transition us, to transform us into a life in which he is king, the, the kingdom life. And therefore, our lives can be characterized by, by his beauty, by pleasing and harmonious relationality. But I think many of us, if we're honest, if we take an honest look at our lives as, as followers of Jesus, as Christians, we would say that very often our lives are fragmented, that very often our lives, our relations are not pleasing and harmonious, that there are times when our lives do not reflect the, the beauty of God. And so the solution that Jesus offers us is really to... Um, to reframe our lives, to reorientate our lives, to, um, you know, to use a word that we use in the fall, to, to, to push reset. And, um, and really, um, you know, come to a place where our lives are more conducive to display his, his beauty. But we've got to get to the point, I think the starting point of all of this is to acknowledge that we have a problem. It's like uh, if you're familiar with all at all with 12-step uh, programs like AA or those those kinds of programs, you, you start by acknowledging the problem. 
So it's like, hi, I'm Chris. And my life experiences some fragmentation. My life does not always display the pleasing, harmonious beauty of God. Not all of my relations are pleasing and harmonious. My life doesn't always reflect the, the beauty of God. And so we start by acknowledging the problem that there is some fragmentation in our lives. And the evidence of that fragmentation is we're stressed out. We're faced with a lot of worry. That's, that's evidence of, of this. And uh, like, do you ever feel, I don't know, do you ever feel like, like you're like you don't control your own life do you ever feel like not only are you not in control of it but others kind of are that you feel maybe a little bit sometimes like a marionette and there's other people that are kind of pulling the strings or maybe you feel a little bit like a pinball and you're just kind of bouncing around various places and it's people pushing the buttons and flapping the paddles and knocking you different places and and that you've You've got obligations here, and you got to answer to this, and you got to do that, and you got to be there, and you got to, you got to, um, you know. There's so many people who need your time and attention, and and uh, who need you to 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 do things, and you can't get it all done, and you feel like you're you're not pleasing people, and some people are displeased with you, and then you're just kind of living with this constant low grade sense of guilt, like you're just not pulling it all off, and there's guilt, like guilt with work and guilt with church and with friends and family, and you've got emails to answer, you've got texts that you haven't replied to, and um, just stressed, just stressed out. There's, um, I mentioned one book by Greg Boyd called Seeing is Believing, but there's another book that, that uh, I think is helpful in this whole conversation, and it's uh, by Randy Frazee, and it's called Making Room for Life, and uh, he has this, I, I think it's right in chapter one of the book, but he's got this diagram and um, so we're, we're kind of borrowing that from Frazee, and you're going to see it in just a second. And, um, and we're, we're adapting this diagram a little bit, but I want to introduce you to Pat. So here is Pat. And uh, we've, we've selected the name Pat on purpose because it's kind of an androgynous name. Pat could be a, a male. Pat could be a female. Uh, it's a little bit like Chris or Jean or uh, like Francis. Those names are, are androgynous too, but those ones are a little too close to home. So we're using Pat here. And uh, Pat is, is stressed out. You can see that Pat's got a lot of, uh, I don't know, you could think of these almost like plates that he's got to keep spinning. These are, these are things, uh, people, activities that demand times, uh, Pat's uh, time and, and attention. And so Pat's got a job, and Pat spends uh, quite a bit of time at work, maybe 40 hours a week, maybe 50, maybe 60, maybe 70. And so work consumes a significant portion of Pat's life, and Pat has a family, Pat has a spouse, and so Pat's spouse, like any spouse, needs time and attention, quality time, quantity time, so there's a big chunk of time there. Pat has children. Let's say that Pat has three children, and so obviously, like any parent, Pat needs time with children, time uh, just to be with them, to play, do homework, those sorts of things. And Pat's kids go to school, and so that's busy enough, but they've also got extracurricular activities because Pat is like, you know, Pat's a 21st century parent and doesn't want his, doesn't want um, his or her uh, kids to miss out on any activities. So there's, uh, you know, there's hockey because maybe one of Pat's kids is like the next Mitch Marner. And then there's guitar lessons because maybe another one of Pat's kids is like the next Eric Clapton or Stevie Ray Vaughan or Cheryl Crow or, or a Bono or Nathan Bile. Uh, you know, maybe one of Pat's kids is like a, a world-class athlete or a world-class musician or an, or an awesome uh, worship leader. But Pat's never going to know that unless the kids are in lessons. And, uh, you know, the same is true for soccer, baseball, lacrosse, dance, robotics, gymnastics, and so on. So all three of Pat's kids are in these extracurricular activities, and this requires all kinds of scheduling. It requires all kinds of time and shuttling kids back, and Pat and Pat's spouse have to, have to do all of this. It costs lots of money, too. 
and Pat likes to play golf and that takes time if you've ever played uh, 18 holes of golf you know that that takes a lot of time and Pat wants to have time to go to the gym and and uh, Pat wants to have some downtime some leisure time because everybody needs that that is super important and Pat likes uh, Netflix uh, for downtime and tries to keep up with Brooklyn Nine-Nine and Blacklist and The Crown and Pat's watched all nine seasons of The Office but now wants to start over with season number one and of course Pat's part of a church and uh, let's call this, uh, let's call Pat's Church, that's a fictitious name, let's call it uh, Blue H2O Church. And so Pat's a Christian, never wants to miss anything that's going on at Blue H2O Church, and the uh, Blue H2O Church has an online service, but they've also got these small groups, and again, let's call them a fictitious name, let's call them Dockings. And uh, so Pat wants to be a part of that, and Pat uh, wants to to help out at Blue H2O Church and uh, help out there in the ministry. And of course, Pat is a Christian, wants to have time for devotions and prayer and Bible study. And then there's that, you know, that's that gender specific docking that Pat participates in as well. And Pat's got friends and friends are a great thing. And that requires a time and attention. And of course, Pat and Pat's spouse and Pat's kids, they live in a house. And uh, so there's chores to do. There's things that need to get done. There's carpet to vacuum and snow to shovel and a shed that needs organizing and groceries that need to be purchased and bills that need paid and a budget that needs to, to be watched over. And there's that dripping tap and that running toilet and that baseboard uh, that still needs painted and those uh, things that still need to be sewn and all of that. And there's just it's just normal stuff. But Pat is all stressed out. Now, in um, Randy Frazee's book, he reports that one out of four people eat fast food at least once a day. And he says that one out of seven people eat a meal in their car at least once a day. Now, I think most of us would at least have a suspicion that fast food is probably about half as healthy and twice as expensive as homemade food. But we're totally willing to overpay and undernourish because life is just so fast and uh, we're on the run. And so you got to kind of eat on the run. And, uh, you know, we already talked about the fact that for many people, this just feels normal. This kind of stressed out life where we're pulled in multiple different directions uh, just feels normal. Like the fish in the fishbowl, we're just immersed and conditioned by this kind of life. Um, but here's the thing, it's killing us. Really, like quite literally, it is killing us. We are not meant to live like this. And the symptoms of this um, are, are really varied. Like different people will present with different uh, symptoms because they're experiencing this kind of stressed out life. Like some people have panic attacks. I don't know if you've ever had one or uh, observed somebody having one, but they're awful. They're ter they're real. And it's, you know, like some like um, schedules and to do's are rolling around in somebody's head. And then all and then just like for no good reason at all, their heart just starts beating faster and faster and pounding and pounding. And then all of a sudden they're experiencing these physical manifestations of things that feel like a heart attack. And it is awful. Other people, they'll present with, um, you know, in a, in a stressed out life with, with like this, they'll, they'll present with depression. They'll just be really down, really blue. Um, for some people, they'll, they'll be irritable, uh, like a short, like a, like a short temper kind of thing. Even if, even if what is stressing them out is really good, like if their work is super busy and because it's going so well and they're just constantly on the run, that stress still might present, even though it's good stuff, might present with a short temper and somebody might be really irritable. Some people, they'll present with this, um, like with numbness, like they'll just kind of withdraw and it's almost like their life is just on some kind of an autopilot and they don't feel the highs like they used to and they don't feel the lows like they used to and they really don't feel the presence of God like they used to. It's just like they're sort of mechanistically going through the motions. But this is literally killing us, pulling our lives in all kinds of different directions. And so we become really fragmented people and torn in, in different directions. And an interesting thing, uh, if you look again here at this chart of Pat's life, the only thing 
that most of these things, if you look at those bubbles around Pat, um, the only thing that they have in common is Pat, right? You see that? Like there's no cohesiveness here. There's no harmony here. You couldn't say that Pat's life, like this diagram of Pat's life, you couldn't say that this is beautiful. You couldn't say that this is a pleasing and harmonious relationship. This is a life that's ruled by got to's, have to's, need to's, and just very little being alive. And um, I am sure you felt like this. Maybe some of you right now feel like this. And it can manifest itself in, in, in many ways. And again, as we've said, we can become really accustomed to this. We can become so conditioned by it that we don't even realize that it's taking place. Well, um, I want to encourage you sometime before Thursday, Thursday night, right? That's New Year's Eve. Sometime before Thursday night, sometime before 2021. I want to encourage you, challenge you even, to take like two minutes, if you can find it, grab a piece of paper and a pen and create your own pat diagram. Put yourself in the middle and then put all those bubbles around of the things that call out and require and demand your time and attention. My guess is that as you create your own pat diagram, you're going to find there's more bubbles than appeared on Pat's diagram. For instance, you might have two jobs. You need two bubbles for that. There's two sets of relationships. Um, maybe like Pat, you've got three kids, but your three kids are in two different schools. You almost need separate bubbles for that kind of thing. And why do we want to do this? Not, not so that we can kind of find any sort of a quick fix. Uh, really, what we want to do is just get a tally to kind of tally up on paper to see it for what it is, all of the different things that pull us in different directions that demand our time and attention, just so we can see on paper the reality of really what is going on. Oh, what do we want to do with this? Well, uh, you'll want to tune in next week uh, for our first online service of 2021. And um, here's what we won't do. We're not going to give like five, you know, five life hacks for slaying worry in 2021 or, or, you know, six secrets or, or the, you know, the seven whatevers of, of destroying worry or destroying stress. No, we're not going to do that. Um, A, because it doesn't work. And B, when it doesn't work for you, all it gives you is a sense that you've, you've just kind of failed at something else and there's more to do's that you haven't done and it just piles on uh, more guilt to this low-grade guilt we just kind of learned to live with anyway so we're not going to do that uh, we're also not going to you know try and prescribe anything like okay here's what you need to do you're watching both blacklist and the office you need to watch one or the other but not both so just remove one of those and things should be a little bit better like that's a good tweak uh to make i think as you look at pat's diagram and as i'm guessing as you look at your own i think you'll come to the conclusion that it is something that it's going to be way insufficient to think that that is something that can be tweaked. I think what we will find that we need is a much more fundamental um, reorientating, a, a reset, a reframing of what our life is about. And so what we'll look at next week is just, th not three, I think four, uh, probably four. Let's go with four. Four basic, simple, biblical principles really foundational truth that I think can can help us to get a grip on what is going on in our lives so that we can reorientate that, that we can reframe and reset so that we can um, have lives that are more conducive to displaying the beauty of God, the pleasing, harmonious relationality that is God that we can put on display the, the shalom uh, of God. So we'll see you next week. Happy New Year. Thank you, Chris. 
I can't think of a better way to close one year and step into a new one than to focus on the beauty of God. We have something really special to close this morning's service. It's a Christmas carol recorded by Michael and Scott Bannerman, Don's sons. They were in a Christmas concert hosted online in Stratford recently, and they've kindly shared this video for us to enjoy in this morning's service. So Happy New Year to each of you. Stay safe and I hope that this holiday and this whole year ahead is just saturated with the hope, the love, the joy, and the peace of Christ. Sigh.